So I just like to start by saying, Opu Mikon Towish Kaawe Peter Nelson He Kaopu Tamo Micha. I'm a Coast Miwok person from uh, the Tamales Bay area. My tribe is the Federated Indians of Great and Ranch Ria. Um, and in our tribe, um, we're both uh, Southern Pomo and Coast Miwok people. Um, the, a little part of the history of our tribe is that um, a, a bunch of different Indian people were uh, put on a rancheria or a reservation all together, and uh, that included Southern Pomo, um, Coast Miwok, even a Yurok person. Uh, it was all the people uh, in the Great and Sebastopol, Tamales, um, those sorts of areas in uh, Southern Sonoma County and uh, Marin County. So we're kind of all in it together here. Um, so that's a little bit about who I am. Like I said, my, my family is from uh, the Tamales Bay Area. Um, I had a great, great grandmother that went to Sherman Indian School. So um, just like a lot of Indian people in California, my family's had that history of uh, being involved with the, the boarding schools. Um, and uh, at that time, my three greats grandmother was taking care of uh, two grandchildren, one of which was my great grandmother's, um, or great great grandmother's uh, child, who's my great grandmother. I know it gets kind of confusing with the genealogies, um, but, uh, but yeah, that, that history was there. So she went to Sherman um, in, in the early 1900s, about 1906, 1907, around there. Um, and eventually when my three greats grandmother was getting sick, um, they, uh, she sent a letter, which we actually found at Sherman, uh, thanks to my partner Olivia, uh, doing some really stellar research. Um, and uh, uh, my three greats grandmother sent a letter saying that she needed um, my two greats grandmother back uh, to take care of the children. And they actually let her go, which is, I think, kind of amazing to, to go back and, and help. Um, but what, uh, what Sherman was about was uh, training people for a life of servitude um, and domestic uh, sorts of jobs. Um, so that's what my uh, two greats grandmother was trained to do. Uh, she worked at the Point Reyes Lighthouse. Uh, she worked in San Rafael doing different kinds of jobs. She worked on a dairy farm. Um, so uh, really kind of uh, humble domestic sorts of jobs. And, and that's what other people in that area did. Um, during during that time, um, so um, that's kind of my family and where I come from. Um, and how did I get here? I'm you know at a university doing archaeology. I'm an academic. Um, I want to acknowledge um, my family and the people that came before me because um, they're really the people that got me here and put me in this position to to be able to have an education. And it was really their work um, that made it possible for me to be here and talk about these things and bring resources back to my tribe. And that's really what my presentation is about, is indigenous archaeology and um, collaborative research um, with my community. Um, first off, I just wanted to say that um, you know, there, there's a map um, made, put together by one of my friends, Lee Panich. Um, it shows what, what the impacts of colonialism have been for California in a really um, kind of um, really distinct visual way. So what you're looking at, all these dots on the map, are federally recognized tribes. And this is why anthropology and archaeology matter and, and why academics can affect people's lives in a really, really real way. Um, so you can see... Um, all of the dots on the map are federally recognized tribes. Then sort of the, um, the black line right over here, um, that, that's the limits of missionization. So all along the coast, there were a series of Spanish missions. And um, you can see that all those dots of federally recognized tribes exist outside of that um, area of mis missionization. Um, there are only just a couple exceptions, and my tribe has been one of the lucky exceptions to that rule. And um, largely, it's not because there aren't tribes there anymore, it's because the work of anthropologists like Alfred Krober, um, you know, saying things like, oh, this tribe doesn't exist anymore, their, their culture is extinct. But, you know, sometimes when the BIA or other anthropologists that Krober would send out would go to an area, they were evaluating people 
based on other work that they've done, or maybe they didn't even go to that area and talk to Indian people in that area. So, you know, it was a really subjective sort of research and um, really rooted in that time of trying to see um, indi indigeneity just through the lens of what those researchers thought it was, um, which is not what indigenous people are and indigenous cultures are. And so there really should be a whole swath of uh, federally recognized tribes in that area, but you don't see them because of that early work. And that's the impact that that work has had um, and the legacy that that work has had on people in California. Um, and there should be a lot more throughout you know, the other areas of California too. Um, right now, my, my partner again has been doing a lot of work on federal recognition in California. Um, there's something like, what, uh, 100 petitions or 80, 81 petitions for, for recognition from other tribes who are um, trying to get their, their tribe and their identity recognized as uh, Indian people in California. So um, that's, that's kind of the, the main reason why I do the work that I do in the way that I do it. Um, you know, we, we have to go out and, um, you know, really uh, talk to people and see what, what are the research questions that uh, the community is interested in. Um, is this research worth doing? What are the impacts going to be of that research? Um, because it has had these effects on people. Um, you know, there are tons of human remains and other objects in the Hearst Museum uh, to this day that um, they, they technically own, um, which, you know, a lot of tribes have a problem with because it's the cultural patrimony um, and ancestors of uh, all these different tribes. You know, those things were taken away from our community. And so uh, we're working with institutions like the Hearst and the Smithsonian and other smaller museums around to either repatriate those items or make sure that they're taken care of, um, you know, in, in a way that we would want them to, to be taken care of. Um, so um, to show you some of the impacts that archaeology um, has had, it's had a really uh, destructive history. Um, you know, this is a, a shell mound from Emeryville. You know, um, I use this example because it's one that most people know about or have some connection to because there's a shopping mall on top of this site now. Um, the, um, the, most of the damage here wasn't actually done by archaeologists. It was, um, you know, that sort of like steam um, equipment right there that's hauling off a lot of the midden soils. Um, a, a lot of those things were taken away because people were developing on those areas. There was a paint factory uh, for a while. Um, you know, and, and a lot of things, uh, the, the midden soils were taken away for things like uh, gardens and landscaping and other sorts of things, even though they contained human remains and other sacred objects. Um, you know, so really a lot of destruction. But archaeology had a lot to do with uh, some of that destruction as well. Um, and so, you know, it, it really is um, sort of my mission to, to do archaeology that's ethical and uh, to promote uh, non-invasive or low-impact uh, ways of doing archaeology because a lot of these sites have been destroyed and we want to preserve as many of them that are still left uh, so that we have that record and that history here. And it, you know, it's, it's a footprint of indigenous people being on the land. And if we take away all of those sites, then you know, uh, we, don't, we don't have that actually in the ground anymore. Um, you know, so uh, you know, there, there are a number of laws now that protect against those types of things happening, those sorts of disturbances to sites. So you know, really early on, the Antiquities Act, we have things uh, now that um, are a lot more relevant in people's lives, like the uh, Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, uh, CEQA, which is the California Environmental Quality Act, and the, uh, the federal version of that, which is the National Environmental Protection Act. All these acts um, say that if you're doing some sort of project, um, you have to consider the impacts to sites from um, you know, cultural sites and then also uh, natural resources like endangered birds and species of frogs and other sorts of things in the area 
Um, and so it, it allows an outlet for um, archaeologists and um, now because of the great work of a lot of uh, indigenous people um, allows comment from uh, tribes and most likely descendants um, to uh, protect our, our sites from development. So um, a, a lot of work has been done and um, uh, you know a lot of sites can be protected now because of the those things but a lot of sites still are excavated um, in the name of development. Uh, there aren't a lot of protections for sites on private land uh, because uh, the way land is owned in America, um, you know, people own everything on their land and so if it's not human remains, they technically own all the artifacts and other things that are there and if, you know, they wanted to develop in that area, there are ways for them to do that, you know. so. Um, you know, there's still a, a long ways to go with um, getting even more protections for sites, but I just wanted to show, you know, what, what there is and how far we have come from that picture that I showed of uh, the Emeryville Shell Mound, it just being all hauled away. Um, you know, there, there are some good protections now. So, um, I, I already explained about uh, Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo people, so I'll just go over that. Um, some of my work is concerned with uh, later history in um, uh, Coast Miwok territory. I'm working at a uh, site in Sonoma County called uh, Tole Lake Regional Park. It's a um, regional park in Sonoma County and uh, working in a collaborative project with uh, the Sonoma County Regional Parks Department and uh, with my tribe. And the reason why I got involved with this project is because um, I, uh, uh, the, the tribe has entered into a co-management agreement with that park to write the master plan. The master plan just tells everyone um, how this park is going to be used in the future and what sorts of activities and things will go on in the park. Say like, we want however many miles of trails all through the park or we want boating or we want, you know, uh, you know on-site camping way in the you know, hinterland of the park or, you know, all, all those sorts of decisions go into this master plan. Um, and so as a part of that, uh, we have to understand the cultural resources that are out there and how they could be impacted by that plan. That's, um, you know, part of the, the CEQA process, the California Environmental Quality Act process to assess the impacts of those sites. So part of my work is involved with that. Uh, also at uh, Tole Lake, um, there's a sacred lake there and, um, there, there were a lot of charm stones that were deposited in that lake because of doctoring. Uh, the reason why I have this slide up is to show you some uh, really significant uh, Coast Miwok people, uh, some of whom were living at the time of um, when some of these sites were occupied at Tole. We have Tom Smith and Maria Copa, um, and they were interviewed by uh, Isabel Kelly, who was an Alfred Krober student. Uh, Tom Smith was a charm stone doctor. Uh, before being uh, a dance leader. And so um, Tom Smith is a really interesting figure because um, you know he, he must have known about Tole Lake and maybe even doctored people there. Um, like I said, we, we get a lot of information um, about our tribe and about our culture from the descendants of these people. Um, Sarah Ballard represents a really important person uh, because she was the last um, speaker of Coast Miwok as a first language. Um, she died in the 1970s and she did a lot of work with Catherine Callahan to document Coast Miwok and those are the records that we have of uh, the Coast Miwok language today in addition to the work that uh, Maria Copa and Tom Smith did uh, with Isabel Kelly. So um, to give you an idea, I always like to situate my project within um, Grayton territory. Um, so the, the map on um, your right is um, all of our tribal territory in uh, Southern Sonoma and Marin County, and the arrow points out where uh, that Tole Lake Regional Park is. So the park is roughly this area right over here. All of that. So um, that encompasses a really huge area. It's a whole watershed, essentially, and um, there are a number of sites in that area. And um, to show you a little bit of what the lake uh, looks like now, this is kind of a cheat because it's when the lake was act actually 
um, actually had some water in it. And um, so this is during the winter. It doesn't have water in it all the time. It was drained for agriculture um, in the late 19th century um, when uh, American people wanted to develop it uh, for agriculture and ranching, essentially. Um, so early on, uh, Jose Altamira went through um, from San Francisco, uh, the Presidio, out through uh, San Rafael, Petaluma, and onto uh, Sonoma and Napa. And what he was trying to do was um, establish a location for the mission, uh, which is now in the town of Sonoma. Um, and when he went through that area, he actually noted uh, Tole Lake and gives some dimensions on it and describes the landscape a little bit. Um, a lot of my work is concerned with the environment and what uh, that whole valley used to look like before contact. And he gives some pretty good descriptions. He said there are oaks in uh, the canyons in the bottom, uh, the, the, the floors of the valley. And um, in some other places around there, he, he said that, um, that the hills were black from burning. The uh, native people had, had burned off the hillsides, which is a really important fact because um, there's a current debate in ecology and archaeology about the extent to which native people managed the landscape and were active agents in, um, in their environments rather than just passive uh, collectors going out, you know, your stereotypical hunter-gatherer going, collecting berries, hunting, you know, deer, that kind of thing. Uh, California people were really sophisticated and went out and uh, did active burning to make the area more biodiverse. They understood the ecology of the area and um, how to um, make plants return what they needed for basketry materials, making long straight uh, shoots of plants so that they would be really good uh, materials for that. Um, you know, making a place more biodiverse, opening up uh, different kind of patchworks of uh, environments uh, brings in a lot more animals and uh, produces a lot more food. So people were actively uh, managing in that way to make their uh, environment more livable. And so you can get hints of that in those uh, historical accounts. So um, another kind of depressing picture about uh, the kind of work that's been done in the past. All of these mortars were taken out of the Tole Valley. Um, it's just an incredible amount of material. And one of the things I think about was that Coast Miwok people were still collecting and uh, gathering acorns and other sorts of things in this area. If you take out all those mortars, it's like taking someone's kitchen out of their house, you know? And, and so if people are going back expecting to find those sorts of things, you know, and, and don't have them, w what do you do? You know, it's a completely changed and colonized landscape. Um, and in, in more ways than you would think than just people coming in, removal of people. Because people were, um, you know, in the mission system. Some people were living outside of that. But people were coming back to these sites. And there's evidence of that um, at some of these Tole sites. There's evidence for napped glass. Um, so people were taking European materials and making them into tra uh, traditional tools. So there's definitely evidence and historical accounts of people going back to this valley. Uh, J.B. Lewis, who is this uh, bearded guy uh, standing next to his horde, um, he talked about native people going through his property to access the Tole Valley and the lake that was there. Um, he collected a number of charm stones too, which aren't uh, depicted. And um, he said that native people would go on their normal hunting and gathering routes, and then they would stop at the lake and have a powwow. And so, you know, whatever that meant, that's how he was interpreting it. Could have been a ceremony. It could have been, um, you know, some of the healing sorts of activities that I was talking about before. Um, but it was definitely a sacred lake. The, the waters there were sacred. And um, because of that, a lot of charm stones got uh, deposited there. And it's still a sacred place for uh, Coast Miwok people today. And one of the reasons why I think that there's so much focus in my tribe on this area and why we have the co-management project that we do with the park is because it's such a special place. So just to give you an idea of you know, these things that I'm talking about, charm stones, I put a drawing in here of charm stones rather than the actual objects because some native people uh, don't like to see the actual item 
and um, you know because they they hold some power and um, you know they they don't want to have uh, contact with them. So uh, drawings I think are fine. If anyone's not fine with them, I'm uh, sorry, and feel free to to leave. But um, so this gives you a range of the shapes of different kinds of charm stones. Um, you know they can be plummet shaped. They can be long, short, uh, there's just um, a whole variety of them. Um, and most of the uses, the reason I think why they uh, were called charm stones is that in some areas they were used as sort of luck charms and um, hunt for hunting and fishing and those sorts of things. Um, but from some of the people in my tribe, um, I've heard that uh, they were used for doctoring people, taking sicknesses out of people, poisoning people, um, you know, th those sorts of activities. And so they were seen as very volatile uh, objects because of those uh, activities that they were involved in. And so um, if you didn't know how to handle them, a lot of people don't like to, you know, touch them or see them. Um, so another cu couple of images of what Tolly Lake might look like uh, from a few of the historic maps. Um, the one on the uh, bottom right is probably uh, the most accurate to how the topography actually looks. So that's probably a really good uh, version of that. But you can see on the, um, the, the lower left, um, that map was from the, um, the land grant from the ranch of Petaluma. And so um, even as far back as that, you can see the Petaluma River, Tole Lake, um, so uh, part of my work is, like I said, low impact um, methods of doing archaeology. So what I'm going to talk about now is doing archaeogeophysics. It's a big long word. Um, so geophysics is basically um, what geologists use, you know, geophysical um, uh, equipment and techniques is what geologists use to look at like the Earth's crust and glaciers and all these kinds of things to understand uh, the geological world around us. Uh, archaeologists use it to identify cultural features within that natural geology. Um, and there's a lot that we can learn about sites, the composition, extent, and depth of sites just by looking at uh, these geophysical methods. And it's been a major part of my work, and I think that if you're not doing geophysics in archaeology, you know, it's kind of um, to everyone's detriment and you're destroying history because, you know, there's so much you can look at through, through geophysics just alone. And um, to not do it is just kind of, um, you know, uh, just ignoring one whole data set that could tie you into um, a bunch of other things that are going on in the site rather than just seeing, like, one little hole in the ground that, um, that you've excavated. So um, the reason why I have Coast Miwok houses up here is because um, one of the things we found were house floors. And um, you know, that, that's a um, you know, direct evidence in the site of people living there and staying for a very long time. Some of these house floors are really thick clay and um, that represents some you know, major occupation. And that's been a debate in archaeology too. Did people live on the mounds? Did they not? Um, in, from ethnographic sources and what I've heard from my elders is that people did live on these sites. But there's still that debate in archaeology. But this may be a way of adding data to that so scientists can understand that you know, people did live on the mounds. Um, so uh, at my site in Sonoma County, people are probably building houses more like the, the Thule house up at the top uh, rather than the redwood plank house. Those were more kind of coastal um, as opposed to interior where I am. So one of the first things we did because we saw depressions on the surface of the site when we cut away the brush, the invasive European grasses that were on top of the site, uh, we saw these depressions. We wanted to um, capture that and, and record it uh, because there are all kinds of cattle around. Um, they've been stomping on the site for about 100 years, but who knows whether, you know, if they would start rooting around and then destroy some of these things. These, these depressions represent houses where people were, were living. And so um, what we did is we used uh, a 3D laser scanner called uh, Terrestrial LiDAR, and um, we, we mapped out the topography of the whole site with really 
high resolution accuracy. So there was one data point um, probably per less than an inch, you know, across the entire site that we did. So you can see that resolution, that whole sort of point cloud as it is, and uh, the site where we did most of the work uh, right down here. Um, and the, the shape of uh, this site is kind of like a platform, and then it drops off uh, into the natural contours of the landscape. And on top of this platform was where everyone was living and, and all of these depressions were. So right here, um, you can see how undulated and wavy and everything the top of the, the mound is. And I think that some of that is disturbance, but a lot of that is um, you know, from these depressions and maybe multiple depressions on top of one another. And uh, this site uh, represents you know, uh, a site that has escaped some of the impacts of development uh, throughout all the years. Because this land was kept as just ranching land, it wasn't plowed on the top, so a lot of the uh, topography on top of it is, is really well preserved. Uh, so the geophysical uh, instruments that we used were ground penetrating radar, magnetometry, and resistivity. And so they each measure a different um, kind of aspect of uh, geology. So uh, the magnetometer, you can kind of think of it as like um, a high powered metal detector. Um, you can sense <clears throat> really um, subtle uh, magnetism, just like um, little bits of ferrous material, metal within uh, rocks and other sorts of things. Uh, it can also detect um, post moles, house floors, all kinds of different uh, uh, cultural features. Um, the one that we use most, though, was um, ground penetrating radar, and you can kind of think of that as like um, a CAT scan or an X ray of a site. Um, so it sends a signal down in the ground and it um, reflects off of an object and goes back up to the antenna and then that resolves into an image of what's there and that's how we found that house floor. So um, the resistivity, I'm gonna go past that. Magnetometry, um, so I was talking about defining the extent of the site. So at this site, there's tons of fire cracked rock, rock that was used um, either around fires or in uh, earth ovens or hot rocks for making acorn mush. Uh, so there's just this uh, clutter of, of fire crack rock all across the site. And I think that that's really what is making the magnetometry show what it shows. And I'll show you what that is. You can basically see the outline of the site where it's really noisy and clustered. That's where the site is. And then where it gets quiet and kind of even, that's the off site. Um, and similarly, in ground penetrating radar, uh, you get the really high amplitude areas, those areas that are um, you know, yellow and uh, red, where right on top of the mound and kind of in an outline of that same circle area, um, and then the rest of the areas are really quiet in the clays. The, the signal of the GPR um, attenuates and dissipates really uh, close to the surface in those areas because the clays are really tough for it to get through. Um, here, there's a really significant feature. I'll show you the house floor. Um, here's a close-up. You can see the circle right there. And that's, that's where that house floor is. I think that a lot of these other blotches all over uh, do represent some activity, and it's probably the, the main central area where people were living. And I'll, I'll give you a few more data sets to back up why I'm saying that. Um, so just to show you kind of what I think is going on and to give you a visual, because all that stuff can look like an inkblot test. So you have a house, the house is uh, retired, then you have soil being deposited on top of that house, and eventually you get a situation where you have stratigraphy, um, you know, these different layers of soil, kind of like a layer cake, and then um, at the bottom, um, buried under all, uh, underneath all of this is that house floor. So this little sliver right there is the house floor, and you have a bunch of soil on top. So right there, you can see the GPR image looks almost exactly the same as that. You know, you have uh, some stratigraphy up here at the top, and then you have this very distinct house floor, and then a 
other stuff going down. Here's another instance where there might be an even larger one. It may be uh, even a special building. Uh, but those are the sor sorts of conversations we can start to have once we have these images, is before any of those are even impacted, we can start discussing, you know, is this large enough or does this look enough like a sweat lodge or a roundhouse to merit, like, you know, really focusing on the preservation and protection of the site because that's a really sensitive area. Um, or is this a mundane house? Um, or, you know, are, are those things things that we don't want to get into? But when you have more information about what's in that site, then um, it could potentially raise the significance of that site. Um, so I was going to show you some, some of the other data that I have while I was saying that, um, you know, this central area might be the, the living space and other activities happening in other areas. So these two um, red circles, the smaller one is that really good house floor at the top that I just showed you, and then the larger one at the bottom is um, that, that other circle. So the mounded area is roughly this square. Um, and you can see that the, um, the darker areas in this are where there are a lot of um, lithic debitage. And what that is is uh, the byproducts of making stone tools. So it's all the little stone flakes that come off from, um, uh, from shaping uh, different kinds of tools, like scrapers, projectile points. Um, other things like that. And so um, you can see that a lot of that, uh, that density is happening around the, the edges of the site. So on top of the site still, but across the, the edges of the top there. If you look at the faunal bones, so all the animal bones uh, on site, so this would be the byproducts of someone's meal, um, those things are happening in the same exact pattern as all of those um, lithic uh, all, all that lithic debitage. Um, so it seems like the, the trash from people's activities is ending up right at the edges of the site and people are living in the center. So this is a really profound thing for archaeologists, you know, so it, it may seem like a really self-explanatory thing, but be able, to be able to prove this or, you know, like hint at this is what's going on is like, oh man, there are some real patterns here, you know, because, you know, uh, yeah, it's just uh, really a really hard thing to do, you know. So we're talking about uh, sp spatially the activities that people were doing on site, and it's it, yeah, it's a really profound thing. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> um, now I've mapped on top of the GPR data um, all the the density of faunal and and lithics. So now you can see that you know those really dark areas, they're kind of mapping in between where the the really high amplitude areas in the GPR are. So, you know, what I was saying before is, you know, this high amplitude stuff, the really bright stuff, you know, that's probably going to be where people are living. And then out here where these dark spots are in this ring around the outside, you know, that's where the trash is going. So people are living in the center or maybe even keeping this area clear and having some houses down below. And then um, the trash is kind of going out to the side. But there are these other things, like this thing right in here, where um, there's very structure was that um, we're finding evidence for a historic building possibly there so you know this could be the, the later historic history of this site and this could be like you know uh, a more sort of cabin-y looking building um, you know because there are lots of nails and broken glass and we even had some nap glass from that area too. Um, uh, another thing to note is that all the groundstone was found kind of on this side of the site and um, that's significant because the uh, the drainage and the spring are also over in that area, so it makes a lot of sense if you have things like mortars, pestles, fragments of those things. Um, you know, if you're near water, um, that makes a lot of sense because you're processing acorn, doing the leaching. So that might be a more of outside space in a working area versus more domestic inside space, um, and then other things going on. So. Anyway, those are some of the thoughts that I'm, I'm thinking about right now. And all that information, uh, just to highlight the low impact strategies, all that information came from surface collection, artifacts that were picked up off the surface of the site, and this geophysical prospection. So you can get all that information and talk about all this history just from 
the things that you see on the top of the site and from these new, newer technologies. So archaeology has come a really long way. Um, and then also, um, if you do some excavation like we did to get some of the uh, botanical materials, you can really target your excavation so that it's not going to do as much impact to the site. So you can just dig very, very small um, units to get really precise information about this site, and then you can leave the rest of the site completely intact. Um, this was just another example of that GPR data. Um, so at the bottom you can see um, that you can actually see the bottom of the site, the, the full depth of the site, which is a really important thing for management because you want to know um, what the, the whole extent of that resource is that you're looking at to, to better know how to manage that. Um, it plays into those plans uh, a lot. So I'll just show you where that line is. Uh, so this line comes across the bottom uh, and it curves up. The, the top of this should actually be bent like the natural topography, but since you know, it's straight, it is curving up. This would probably be straighter, but that's the bottom of the hidden soil there. And this is that house floor uh, that, that I showed you before. So an image that and then you know, the, the hidden soil at the bottom. So. develop and then go back down. So there it is, going through. And so that's it. Um, so anyway, um, I'm running out of time. One of the things that uh, we were doing uh, with the samples that we did take, uh, like I said, we're interested in the environment before contact. So uh, we're putting some samples through this process called flotation. It sounds scientific. It's just basically a series of buckets with water, and you're agitating the sample so that um, the botanical materials come up and go over a spout there into chiffon mesh. And then you can look at the charred seeds and other botanical things that, uh, that come out of there. And then we can uh, take a look at what sorts of plants were um, at Tole in the past, and then um, have those things um, enter into the management plan for the future, doing um, restorations and other things um, in a way that um, is really specific to that area using the information that we have from, from the sites. So those are just some images. So some things that we found, um, these are manzanita seeds, clover, tarweed, um, phacelia, which is a fire adapted plant, so looking for evidence of uh, landscape management, and then also tons and tons of grasses. Here's just kind of what those plants look like um, in the environment today. So anyway, I, I hope that uh, what you've taken from my presentation was that um, we can do uh, archaeology in a low impact or a completely non-invasive way. Um, and um, there have been impacts to these sites, but we're working to protect them. And, um, and, and really, you know, just like knowing about these histories and, and knowing a little bit about the concerns that um, indigenous people have with our sites and, and doing protection of them or advocating for that, you know, um, just take that away from my presentation, that these sites really are significant. It's part of our history, and a lot of them are impacted um, every day. And so we want to raise the awareness about, um, you know, that, that these sites are impacted and um, what we can do to save as many of these things as, as we can. So thank you.